passage of scripture that we'll be looking at in some detail is behind me. It's 3 John verses 9 and 10. John, of course, is the author of the Gospel of John, and he wrote three epistles. This is the third of his letters. And here he writes about a terrible problem. And the terrible problem is a man by the name of Diotrephes. And so, we read in verses three or 9 through 10 that John writes, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. So if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, gossiping maliciously about us. And not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers, and he also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. You know, every church has a shepherd and usually a plurality of shepherds, and every shepherd has a staff. And by a staff I mean here, I mean People who are volunteers, who lead different ministries, might be a children's director, it might be a youth leader, a worship leader, all the different leaders that are within the church is what I'm talking about. It's also the maybe the deacons or elders or whatever the church board is called. That's what I mean by the staff, those who work alongside the pastor to care for God's people and to reach people with the gospel of Christ. Now, every shepherd needs a, a staff. But the problem is, is that sometimes in a church there can come a staff infection. And this is a play upon words in English in the sense that a staff is like a shepherd's staff. But then there's also a disease that's called a staff infection. One is spelled S-T-A-F-F, -F, and one, the other one is spelled S-T-A-P-H. And so we're looking at what happens when a staph infection comes on to the staff of a church. Well, first I want to read to you about how painful a staph infection is. From the New York Times, um, this article in 2006 about a basketball player. His name was Drew Gooden of the Cleveland Cavaliers. He said, I had a staph infection and it was the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my whole life. I kept playing on it, thinking it was going to heal, but the infection got worse and worse to the point where my legs swelled up and I couldn't even bend my knee. When a church gets a staph infection, it's very serious. In fact, it's about the only thing that the shepherd can think about is this staph infection that's just killing him every day. And so this metaphor is helpful, and we're going to use this metaphor of a staph infection to talk about how to treat a staph infection. Well, the first thing we need to know is, the first truth is that not every serious not every sickness in a church is this serious staph infection. It's kind of rare. Even the staph bacteria can be present but not cause an infection. And indeed, there are many low-grade illnesses that occur in every church. And we have to learn to live with them, kind of like living with a cold or living with a headache or living with... Uh, something that is not debilitating, so painful we can't even walk, but it's still a sickness and it's a low-grade infection. 
We also have to be careful here that there are times of conflict and pain when a staff is trying to learn to work together. There's the old group dynamic saying that first a group of leaders will form. They're called to work together. And then they have to storm. They have to go through conflict as they're trying to figure out what each person's role is. And then they begin to form. They begin to understand how to work with each other. And then they can perform. So this is a natural flow in the formation of any team that there's going to be forming and then storming and then norming and then performing. And that's not what we're talking about in a staff infection. Leaders have to really get good at Colossians 3.13 where Paul says we need to bear with each other. We need to forgive each other. Love covers a multitude of sins and faults and mistakes. And we have to bear with people. They're going to hurt our feelings. They're going to do things that are dumb. They're going to do things that maybe are a mistake toward other people. And we have to bear with those things. That's not a staff infection. That's the stress of ministry. Maybe a clash of roles. Maybe a minor illness. But when, an, when a person's immune system is weakened, this is the second truth, this kind of serious infection like a staph infection can come. That's true in staph infections. A surgical wound, a bloodstream infection, pneumonia can weaken a person and make them vulnerable in a hospital to getting a staph infection because their whole system is weakened. What are the things that weaken a church's whole system? Well, first is spiritual pride. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says that we're to clothe ourselves with humility toward one another. When we get up in the morning, we need to not only be careful what we wear in terms of clothes, we need to clothe ourselves with humility to think of others as better than ourselves. C.S. Lewis, in his great book, Mere Christianity, calls pride the great sin. He says there's no vice in the world which we hate in other people, but we ever imagine that we're guilty of ourselves. I've heard people admit that they're bad-tempered, that they can't keep their head about girls or drink, that even that they're cowards. But I don't think I've ever heard a Christian accuse himself of this vice. And at the same time, I've seldom met anyone who wasn't a Christian who showed the slightest mercy toward others who had it. There's no fault that makes us more unpopular and no fault that we're more unconscious of ourselves. The vice I'm talking about is pride or self-conceit. And the virtue that's the opposite is, of course, humility. And you know, churches can develop a spirit of pride. Things might be going well, and so we take pride in people coming to Christ, that people are coming, the, the building is full, or maybe that the youth group is really effective, or that we've got great worship, that we have a dream team of leaders. We can develop pride over about anything. And if we do, then we're weakening our system. Jim Collins has written a very important book, Good to Great. He tracks what it is that are the practices of corporations, global corporations, and what they do to move from being a good company to a great company. It's an excellent read. Well, he followed it up years later by another excellent book, and he called it How the Mighty Have Fallen. And he tracks why it is that some of these great companies actually began to decline and to fail and to fall. And he said that the first thing that they detected in these companies that began to decline was that pride enters in, arrogance, self-conceit, thinking that they've got everything wired, and they don't see that when things begin to decline. 
There's a second thing that can weaken our system, not only spiritual pride, but hidden hypocrisy. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, Be on your guard against the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, or the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, Diotrephes was probably very zealous for the faith, but he was covering up something on the inside that he wanted to be first. And that's the way hypocrisy is. We make one presentation on the outside, but the word hypocrite means that we're really play acting. We're a spiritual actor. We're covering up. We're making it appear that we're walking with Christ when we're not. We make it appear that we love our family when we don't. Integrity on the inside. Integrity is is this being the same on the inside that we are on the outside. And if a church starts to lose that, we're weakening as a system. And then the third area that we can be weakened by as a church and be vulnerable to a staff infection is either license on the one hand, being allowing sin, or being legalistic. The Corinthian church allowed immorality. They allowed a man to have his father's wife, probably a stepmom, and they were proud about how tolerant they were. But Paul says, you've allowed leaven in. You've leavened your body. You've allowed evil in. The Galatian church had the opposite problem. They were allowing legalism in. They allowed people to add all kinds of different legalistic things in order to be a Christian beyond what the Word of God clearly teaches. All kinds of legalistic rules can be there. In Scripture, there's things like not eating meat or We can say not having any alcohol or not having any caffeine or that there's never divorce that's permitted or no TV or no movies or on and on the list can go where we add all these things that are beyond Scripture. You know what happens in churches that become more and more legalistic? What I've seen is that there is a generation of people who will stay when a church is legalistic. It's their church. But the next generation... The young people, they leave. They don't want all those rules and regulations that make no real sense. And so legalism and license can weaken a church, make it vulnerable to a staff infection. And so the third thing that we need to see is that not every infection is a staph infection, that we can be allowing things that weaken our immune system. That's the second truth and make ourselves vulnerable, finally, to what a staph infection is. We're told very clearly here that the essence of it came with a man named Diotrephes, and the essence and the, uh, the root of his problem was he loved to be first. He didn't want to just be the first among equals, which is sometimes the term for a pastor with other elders. He wanted to be first. He wanted to control the show. He, his way was Yahweh. He was self-willed. He was in love with himself, a lover of self, as 2 Timothy 3 warns us against. And then he began to manifest all of these staph infection problems. And notice that one of the things that he did I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. He began shunning even the Apostle John. This is one of the things that a Diotrephes will do. They will shun people who won't line up behind them. And so they'll say to other leaders, if you don't follow me, then they shut them out. It can happen in a worship ministry. If you don't do the worship exactly the way I say it should be, then you can't be on the worship team. It can happen in a youth ministry. If you don't do youth ministry exactly how I say, then get out. I'll have nothing to do with you. That's the spirit of a Diotrephes who wants to be first. 
and doesn't know how to be collaborative, doesn't know how to work together. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. The essence, really, of a diatrophies is what Paul calls in Acts chapter 20 a wolf. They are a wolf among the sheep. And Paul writes, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw disciples after them, so be on your guard. The two characteristics of a wolf is they first they distort the truth. And we're going to see in a minute how they do this through slander and gossip, distorting the truth about people. And why do they do this? Because they want to be first. They want to have a following. They want people to follow them rather than the people who are the duly appointed leaders of a church. And so as John goes on, he says in verse 9 and 10, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. So if I come, I will call attention to what he's doing, gossiping maliciously about them. In the Wall Street Journal of March 12, 1981, there was this full-page ad. I put it in my files, and it said this. There's a snake that poisons everybody. It topples governments. It wrecks marriages. It ruins careers. It busts reputations. It causes heartache. It brings nightmares and indigestion. It spawns suspicion. It generates grief. It dispatches innocent people to cry in their pillows. And even its name hisses in English. It's called gossip. Office gossip. Shop gossip. Party gossip. It makes headlines and heartaches. But before you read a story, ask yourself, is it true? Is it fair? Is it necessary? If not, then shut up. That's really what Diotrephes needed to do. And John was going to bring attention to him and stop it. And so the nature of a staph infection is it begins with someone like Diotrephes who loves to be first. They shun people who won't follow them. They gossip about people to get them to fall in line or to drive them away because they want a following. 